My name is Vicki Marthaler, and I represent the women of Grace Lutheran Church here in Hendersonville, North Carolina. We welcome you to this Reading Theater for Children. I invite you to grab your favorite blanket, get comfy and cozy for the next 30 minutes or so, as we share a few of our favorite books. And may our gracious Lord and his favor and peace be upon this time. This book is Mr. Nick's Knitting, written by Margaret Wilde and illustrated by D. Huxley. Every morning on the seven o'clock train to the city, Mr. Nick opened his briefcase and took out his knitting. Mr. Nick loved to knit, and so did his friend, Mrs. Jolly. Mrs. Jolly knitted toys like hedgehogs and kangaroos and monkeys and lions. Mr. Nick knitted sweaters, big ones, small ones, for his 22 nieces and nephews who grew bigger each year. <laughs> Goodness. Mrs. Jolly helped Mr. Nick when he dropped his stitches and he helped her untangle her yarn. Mrs. Jolly was a very untidy knitter. While they knitted, they looked at the other passengers and stared out the window at the tops of roofs into small backyards and at yachts and ferries in the harbor. I love traveling by train, said Mrs. Jolly. There is always something to see. Mr. Nick loved knitting and sitting next to Mrs. Jolly, and the other passengers enjoyed listening to the click, clack, click of the needles as Mr. Nick and Mrs. Jolly knitted for 45 minutes all the way to the city. One Monday morning, Mrs. Jolly wasn't on the seven o'clock train to the city. Mr. Nick took out his knitting as usual and knitted by himself. Mrs. Jolly wasn't on the train on Tuesday or on Wednesday either. Mr. Nick dropped three stitches and there was no one to help him find them. He missed Mrs. Jolly. It was no fun knitting without her beside him. On Thursday, there was a message for Mr. Nick and it said, your friend, Mrs. Jolly, is very ill. She is in the hospital. Well, that morning, Mr. Nick didn't catch the seven o'clock train to the city. Instead, he went shopping. He bought Mrs. Jolly a get well card, six balls of beautiful pink wool, and a new pair of knitting needles. Then he went to visit her. Mrs. Jolly was all alone in a small white bed in a small white room. Oh, I'm so glad you've come to see me, she said to Mr. Nick. The doctor says I'm going to be in bed for a long, long time. I miss traveling with you on the train. The nurses are very kind to me, but there's nothing interesting to look at here. Nothing at all. Mr. Nick gave her the six balls of beautiful pink wool and the new knitting needles. He helped her cast on. I think I'll knit a pink elephant, said Mrs. Jolly. Oh, but then she began to cry. She didn't want to be in the hospital for a long, long time. She missed looking at all the other passengers. She missed staring out the window at the tops of roofs into small back gardens at yachts and ferries in the harbor. Mr. Nick helped her untangle her yarn 
and then gave her a big hug. Then he went home to think of a way to cheer up Mrs. Jolly. In the morning, Mr. Nick caught the seven o'clock train to the city. He opened his briefcase and took out his knitting. But this time, he wasn't knitting a sweater for one of his 22 nieces and nephews. He was knitting something very special, something that had lots and lots of small squares. Mr. Nick knitted nonstop for seven days and seven nights. Oh my gosh, look at all the different colors he's got here. Oh. He knitted during his lunch hour and in the bathtub while he cooked his dinner and while he listened to the radio. And of course, he knitted on the train, click, clack, click, for 45 minutes all the way to the city. On the eighth day, Mr. Nick sewed all the squares together and went to visit Mrs. Jolly in the hospital. Oh, Mrs. Jolly looked very sad and lonely in her small white bed in the small white room. I'm so glad you've come to see me, said Mrs. Jolly. Tell me, what's been happening on the train? What did you see out the window? There's nothing interesting to look at here, nothing at all. So Mr. Nick gently placed his big package on the bed and helped her unwrap it. Oh, <gasps> Mrs. Jolly didn't say anything for a moment. And then she burst into tears and said, oh, I'm so happy. This is the best present anyone has ever given me. Now I'll always have something interesting to look at even if I have to stay in the hospital for a long, long time. And she gave Mr. Nick a big hug. Look at all the squares he knitted for her in a big blanket. You got the conductor and people and the ducks in the pond, all the things they would see from the train. So the next morning, on the seven o'clock train to the city, Mr. Nick opened up his briefcase and took out his knitting. He was knitting a sweater for one of his 23 nieces and nephews who grew bigger each year. And at the same morning at seven o'clock in the hospital, Mrs. Jolly took out her knitting. While she knitted, she looked at the passengers and stared at the tops of roofs into small back gardens and yachts and ferries in the harbor. Click, clack, click went Mr. Nick's and Mrs. Jolly's needles as they knitted happily for 45 minutes all the way to the city. <laughs> Mr. Nick's Knitting. Hello again. Uh, this time I'm going to be reading another Berenstein Bears book entitled In the Dark by Stan and Jan Berenstein. Being afraid of the dark doesn't just happen to you. It happens sometimes to little bears too. Brother Bear, said Sister impatiently, are you going to take all day to pick your books? Sister and brother were at the Bear Country Library. Sister had already chosen her books and was waiting at the checkout desk. Hold your horses, said brother. I'm looking for a good mystery. Whoops. Sister Bear usually took out storybooks and books about nature, and sometimes books of poems. Brother liked those too, but lately he'd become interested in mysteries, especially spooky ones. 
Hey, this one looks good, he said finally. Okay, let's check out. The case of the crying cave. Woo! Hmm, said sister, looking at the cover. It was called the case of the crying cave. It looks scary to me. Say, this is really good, said brother later that evening when the Bear family had settled down for some reading. Would you like me to read it to you? Asked, he asked sister. Sister was looking at a storybook about three kittens who were arguing about which was the prettiest. And it was a little boring. Or are you scared, teased brother. Of course not, said sister. She left her book on the floor and climbed onto the bench to sit beside him. The mystery began quietly. It, took a, it told about some bear scouts who were on an overnight camp out. When the scouts discovered a dark secret cave, brother's mystery began to get a little exciting. And when the cave began to cry and wail, it was anything but quiet. Woo! cried the deep, dark, mysterious, or mysterious cave. Red brother with a lot of expression. Who Stop, said sister, putting her fingers in her ears. That's enough. And she went back to her storybook. Scaredy bear, scaredy bear, teased brother. And that's quite enough of that, added Papa Bear, looking up from his paper. At the cubs' bedtime, Papa and Mama said good night, turned off the light, and left the cubs in the usual sleepy darkness. Outside the treehouse, the bright, Busy sounds of day had given way to the soft, soothing sounds of night. The quiet conversation of frogs and toads, the soft cry of the owl, the sigh of the night wind. And if you listened very hard, you could almost hear the softest sound of all, the sound of lightning bugs switching their lights on and off, on and off. But inside the treehouse, Sister Bear wasn't even beginning to fall asleep. That night the dark didn't seem the least bit quiet and sleepy. In fact, it seemed like the spooky darkness of a scary cave. And the friendly old chest of drawers and funny clothes tree that Papa had made didn't seem so friendly and funny. They seemed more like cave creatures. So when Brother decided to tease her a little more by making a wailing noise, a really spooky wailing noise. It gave her quite a scare. Mama, Papa, she cried. Hurry, come quick. And come quickly they did. Papa rushed into the dark room and tripped over the clothes tree. Mama rushed in after Papa and tripped over him. In the commotion, sister fell out of bed and landed on both of them. Then brother, who had started it all with his spooky wail, turned on the light. What a mess! Just sister, still scared, was holding on to Papa. Papa was holding on to the toe he had stubbed, and Mama was looking for the nightcap she had lost in the confusion. All three of them were pretty annoyed with Brother Bear. It turned out to be a very long night in the Bear's treehouse. Papa and Mama tried to explain that there was nothing to be afraid of in the dark except maybe running into a clothes tree and stubbing your toe. But it didn't do any good. Sister absolutely refused to go to sleep with the light off. And brother positively insisted that he couldn't fall asleep with the light on. The next morning, the bear family was very sleepy-eyed. Boy, said brother yawning, I sure don't want to go through another night like that. Neither do I, said Papa, and I think I have an, an idea that might help. He took sister's hand. Come with me, he said. Where are we going, she wanted to know. Up to the attic. The attic? But it's dark in the attic, even in the daytime. I know, said Papa, but there's something I want to show you. Anywhere Anyway, there's nothing so special about the dark. It's just part of nature, like the light. It's your imagination that makes the dark seem spooky sometimes. What's imagination, asked sister. 
Imagination is what makes us think that chests of drawers and closed trees are cave creatures. I wish I didn't have one, said Sister. Don't say that, said Papa. A lively imagination is one of the best things a cub can have. It's imagination that lets us paint pictures, make up poems, invent inventions. The trick is to take charge of your imagination and not let it take charge of you. When they got to the attic, Papa began to rummage through boxes looking for something. Sister tried to follow Papa's advice and not let her imagination take charge. And it worked. A spooky shape turned out to be the shadow of some old tools. What looked like a giant was really some piled up furniture. Here it is, said Papa, my old nightlight. The one I used when I was a cub and had a little trouble falling asleep in the dark. Sister couldn't quite believe that her big, powerful Papa was ever afraid of the dark. Oh, sure, said Papa. Most of us are at one time or another. How about reading the rest of the case of the crying cave, Sister asked Brother later that day. Are you sure you want me to? Sure, I want to see how it turns out, she insisted. When it turned out that there was nothing very spooky about the terrible wailing noise, it was caused by wind blowing across an opening in the roof of the cave, like the noise you make when you blow across the top of a bottle. Sister was a little disappointed. And that night, when she and brother were all settled down in the cozy glow of Papa's old nightlight, she said so. I was pretty disappointed by the way the case of the crying cave ended. Why, asked brother. Because, she said, I was hoping the wailing would be a really spooky, scary monster. And she leaned down from her bunk bed over brothers and made a spooky, scary monster face at him. Cut that out, cried brother. Then sister went right to sleep. But Brother lay awake for quite some time, listening to the owl hoots and thinking that maybe he'd had enough mysteries for a while. Our next book is a classic. It's called The Kissing Hand. It's written by Audrey Penn and illustrated by Ruth E. Harper and Nancy M. Leake. The Kissing Hand. Chester Raccoon stood at the edge of the forest and he cried. I don't want to go to school, he told his mother. I want to stay home with you. I want to play with my friends and play with my toys and read my books and swing on my swing. Please. May I stay home with you? Hmm, oh, look at he's even got a tear in his eye. Oh, Mrs. Raccoon took Chester by the hand. She nuzzled him on the ear. Sometimes we all have to do things we don't want to do, she told him gently, even if they seem strange and scary at first. But you will love school once you start. Hmm. You'll make new friends and play with new toys. You'll read new books and swing on new swings. Besides, she added, I know a wonderful secret that will make your nights at school seem as warm and cozy as your days at home. Hmm. Oh, Chester wiped away his tears, and he looked interested. A secret? What kind of secret? Oh, it's a very old secret, said Mrs. Raccoon. I learned it from my mother, and she learned it from hers. It's called the kissing hand. The kissing hand, asked Chester. What's that? I'll show you. And Mrs. Raccoon 
took Chester's left hand, spread out his tiny fingers into a fan. Then, leaning forward, she kissed Chester right in the middle of his palm. <laughs> Chester felt his mother's kiss rush from his hand, up his arm, and into his heart. Even his silky black mask tingled with a special warmth. Look at all the hearts. Mrs. Raccoon smiled. Now, she told Chester, whenever you feel lonely and need a little loving from home, just press your hand to your cheek and think, Mommy loves you, Mommy loves you, and that very kiss will jump to your face and fill you with toasty, warm thoughts. She took Chester's hand and carefully wrapped her fingers around the kiss. Now, do be careful not to lose it, she teased him. Oh, but don't worry. When you open your hand and wash your food, I promise the kiss will stick. Hmm. Chester loved his kissing hand. Now he knew his mother's love would go with him wherever he went, even to school. Oh, look at he's even playing and he's in different places now. That night, Chester stood in front of his school and he looked thoughtful. Suddenly he turned to his mother and grinned. Give me your hand, he told her. Remember that raccoons are nocturnal, so they would go to, they're always awake at night, so he has to go to school at night. Chester took his mother's hand in his own and unfolded her large, familiar fingers into a fan. Next, he leaned forward and kissed the center of her hand. Oh, that's sweet. Now you have a kissing hand too, he told her. And with a gentle goodbye and I love you, Chester turned and danced away. There he goes. Look at the bunnies are going, the fox. Mrs. Raccoon watched Chester scamper across a tree limb and enter school. And as the hoot owl rang in the new school year, she pressed her left hand to her cheek and smiled. The warmth of Chester's kiss filled her heart with special words. Chester loves you, it sang. Chester loves you. See, there she's got her hand up to her face. And there's Chester at school. Look at everyone who's shown up. And it ends. Can you do that? Can you put your two fingers down? That's the sign for I love you. The Kissing Hand.